Good evening and welcome to Pitch Club. I'm Jennifer Arthur with Angel MD, and in a moment I will turn this over to our producer and host, Dr. Katie Richardson. Tonight we are also very fortunate to have a special guest host, Dr. Happy Thakar, who is one of the co-chairs of Angel MD's Cardiology Clinical Advisory Board. A little more about Dr. Thakar. He's a board certified cardiologist who practices at UCLA Health. He has expertise in treating patients with all types of cardiovascular diseases, such as hypertension, lipid disorder, valvular heart disease, abnormal heart rhythms, coronary artery disease, and peripheral vascular disease. He's received his medical degree from Duke University School of Medicine, and then completed his internship and residency at Washington University in St. Louis, followed by his fellowship in cardiovascular diseases at UCLA. I'd like to take a few minutes to share some updates on Angel MD. In the last 18 months, some of you have participated in our training and educational workshops and courses. We're excited that we're going to be taking this to a whole new level with the launch of Angel MD Academy on April 10th. The website for the Angel MD Academy will go live on March 15th, and we welcome your feedback. Speaking of websites, we have been slowly overhauling the Angel MD website for the past six months. While there's still much to do, we welcome you to log in and to send us your feedback. If you aren't a registered member, it doesn't take very long, so take the 30 seconds or more to register. The website's designed to be a utility to help us connect, educate, and inform our community, and we want to make sure that you are part of this community. As such, your input and your ideas are valued. Before we begin, I want to thank our sponsor, Side Hustle MD. The Side Hustle platform is designed to educate and connect clinicians to all the entrepreneurial opportunities that exist outside of clinical medicine. We'll provide a link in, to their educational programs in tomorrow's follow-up email for anyone interested in learning more. Following each of the presenters, we do have a Q&A session. And so please put your questions in the Q&A section, which is just to the right of the chat tab. It's got the little quote with the Q in it. We also have a live poll going throughout the event. This has questions that come directly from the startups and they would appreciate your valuable feedback. So we ask that you please take a couple minutes to complete the polls. Finally, for those who want to continue the dialogue, we will have a networking event following the presentations and both the companies presenting tonight, as well as our two pitch club extensions, Fisher Imaging and MRI Online, will all have a table. There will also be a table for Angel MD for any of you who have questions or want to learn more about our company. It's easy to join. Just click on a chair or click the join button below the table and you'll be brought into the breakout room. So, so I'll introduce us. We are iCardio AI, and we develop an AI assistant that interprets echocardiograms, leveraging a data set we have of over 200 million ultrasound images. So, you know, as we all know, heart disease is a growing in the United States for a number of reasons, and diagnostic tools are advancing with the growth of the problem. So modern hot handheld ultrasound technology is, you know, it's a, it's a huge innovation in medical imaging, and it's quickly becoming the number one means by which clinicians are investigating or diagnosing potential cardiac diseases. And it's, it's growing at near 20% annually. And it's quickly becoming, I guess, what we call the stethoscope of the future, where ease of use and low cost allow for quick imaging. And the problem with mass adoption of, of you know, what is really an advanced device is that many users are often unfamiliar with interpreting the information. And there's a surplus of complicated information in need of this interpretation and we're seeing a shortage of cardiologists at the same time, tons of new echoes are being taken. So clearly in an assistive diagnostic AI that stands between the clinician at the point of care and the diagnostic outcome is required, which is why we're building the iCardio AI you know, assistant to provide real time dependable results at the point of care. iCardio AI is putting the knowledge of, of an experienced echo reader in the hands of anyone, providing information in real time to give doctors accurate results and confidence in the read. So all this is device agnostic, it's available through the cloud. And I want you to think about having Google Maps on your smartphone to provide information on your route. And once an individual is used to having an AI assistant, it quickly becomes indispensable. And when a clinician has this in their hand, they're, they're not gonna wanna diagnose without it. 
The software identifies all the anatomical landmarks um, of the heart for the clinician and can output measurements such as wall thicknesses, you know, aortic valve diameters, aortic root diameters, et cetera. And we can perform calculations like ejection fraction that aid in the diagnosis of cardiomyopathies. But most importantly, we have the uh, we have abnormality and disease detection capabilities, such as you know, like identifying factors that can aid in the diagnosis of conditions such as uh, HCM, you know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And all these would be available in real time to the end user through his or her device or through a web application. So, you know, the impetus and competitive edge of iCardio AI is our data set, which is comprised of over 200 million clinically annotated ultrasound images and is the largest data set that we know of in the United States, you know, much larger than even industry behemoths like GE. Um, and we, have, we have full usage rights. It's fully owned. It's HIPAA compliant and it's totally heterogeneous and representative of the United States population. So what we do is we run this data through a standard machine learning process. And the clinical annotation allows us to immediately validate our algorithms, you know, and, and keep increasing their accuracy. And in practice, um, you know, when a, clinician take, when a clinician takes a scan, below is what it looks like. So first, the images are received from the clinician. You know, the view and the anatomical landmarks are identified. In this case, it's an apical four chamber. And the image goes through pre-processing. Then relevant key points and measurements are gleaned and displayed. And the system detects abnormalities, which in this case, it's basal septal hypertrophy which feeds into a larger recommendation. And in this case, the platform recognizes that the study exhibits symptoms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with 80% confidence. And so, you know, this platform produces results which are accurate and consistent. And, you know, the ASC cites inherent problems in the interpretation of ultrasound. So the most notable claim is it's, there's very wide inter and even intra operator variability when it comes to interpreting and measuring landmarks with, within an echo. So through deep learning, the iCardio AI can overcome this variability. So it allows more accurate and more reproducible measurements. And the platform hosts a number of robust algorithms, which can be sorted into categories such as, you know, key point or frame detection problems. And so here's an example of some of the experiments and the validation that we've done. So if you look at the top right, you can see that the figure is predicting endpoints for linear measurements in echo. So we run a validation by showing the, the length of the prediction compared to the length of the ground truth created by an actual technician. And what we find is that there's a really excellent Pearson's correlation, which demonstrates that the AI is, is perfectly capable of mimicking a human interpreter. And if you look at the bottom, you'll see two ROC curves, which are used to show performance of models. The larger the area under the curve, the more accurate the model. And we were able to rapidly train an AI model and achieve an area under the curve of uh, 0.89 with an accuracy of 96% for basal septal hypertrophy. And you know, this, is, this is more robust than anything we've seen pu published in any literature. And what's, what's even more compelling is that for a condition like aortic valve stenosis, our results show that we're able to predict it with an incredible 98% accuracy. So these are just examples of two of our models and uh, you know, we have many dozens more and are constantly creating new ones. So we founded iCardio AI in 2018 using um, our chief medical officers accompany diagnostic partners data set as the, the basis. And prior to our 1 million uh, pre-seed in 2021, we, we built out data infrastructure and we built a proof of concept algorithms, which enabled us to secure you know, some contracts, including a five-year collaboration with GE Healthcare. So we have a working demo platform right now, and we're adding AI models and tools at a very fast pace to get to our first 510K submission which we call the iCardio AI Brain V1. And this first product iteration will contain diseases and measurements which we view as most clinically useful, such as HCM and injection fraction. And when it clears the FDA, it'll be commercially available through hardware vendor integration, which we see in the current market would have a, you know, a SaaS price point of $200 annually per end user. Uh, currently, we're seeking 3 million for seed funding to continue development and build out our commercialization efforts. And as the first iteration of the product is clearing, we'll be working on and building out and submitting the second version of the iCardio AI brain, which will contain most diseases and clinically useful information, thereby becoming you know, a true full-fledged AI assistant once cleared in 2024. And this will allow us to generate very significant revenues and explore expansion and exit opportunities through 2025, for which there are a number of players in the space that are strongly interested in buying a platform like, like ours. So, you know, our team has experience building a number of companies, um, and we also we really have a deep experience.
very like deep expertise in in cardiology, AI, software engineering, and regulatory experience. And in closing, you know, we're looking for you know investors to commercialize our product. However, we're also accepting small checks of twenty five to fifty thousand from key opinion leaders in the space. And we're certainly looking to sign up early adopters and beta testers to collect feedback, you know, as we go to market. So I hope you enjoyed our presentation. And uh, I guess I urge you to join us in creating the future of Echo. Very cool, Jacob. Thank you very much. I love the idea of using the product as the AI digital assistant, uh, helping the clinician with their uh, existing workflow. Dr. Thakar, um, I would love to bring you in on this. And first of all, what do you think of these handheld echo cardiograms as, uh, as kind, of, kind of part of your existing practice? And what do you think of the iCardio solution in terms of its uh, implementation? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mike. Uh, Jacob, that was a great presentation. Um, it sounds like a really exciting uh, 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 topic that you guys are are addressing there. Uh, you know, point of care ultrasound is quickly expanding, and and, and it's certainly the case that um, ICUs, ERs, even clinical settings and outpatient settings have now started to pick it up. Um, so I'm really impressed by your guys's. Um, accuracy and the proofs of concept algorithms that you guys demonstrated, the, the kind of more practical questions that this kind of raises for me, uh, which, you know, right now, I would love to have a point of care ultrasound device, but practically, there's uh, some limitations that make it cumbersome. Um, and so I'd like to get your thoughts on, on, on that. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the main limitations we see in not just cardiac imaging, but all sorts of clinical fields is the limitation of payment and reimbursement causes a lot of um, technologies that are great in principle to be not so widely adopted. Uh, have you guys thought about that? How, how, how will doctors get reimbursed for images um, or hospital system get reimbursed for images that you guys are processing or will they, you know, because I think that would be a significant consideration for, for this. Yeah. So, you know, that's always the question is, uh, you know, in healthcare, like, you know, who's paying for this? Um, well, the good news is that first of all, the, the price point that we're operating at, is uh, it's 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 low enough that uh, it consumers are actually willing to shell, you know, consumers and doctors are willing to shell out of pocket for it, and we're also seeing this business model being proven out. So you know, I'll, so I'll, I guess I'll I'll just put it in a larger context. So where where we view our primary like product market fit is partnering with ultrasound hardware manufacturers as a SaaS on their platform. Um, there's dozens of these, these, you know, hardware manufacturers entrants in the fields. And we're seeing two things is that the price point of the, you know, the handheld ultrasound devices is dropping dramatically and B they're, they're shifting to a subscription model where the device is bought upfront for maybe, you know, $2,000 and the user pays an annual subscription for the software. So for example, right now you can go on one hardware manufacturer site, butterfly network. And in addition to the default software, you can pick and choose rudimentary software modules you know, for $200 annual subscription. I um, mean, if you go through their 10K, you know, their subscription revenue is very significant. Um, and, you know, the software that's currently available is it's quite primitive. Um, and we view ourselves as one of the first major apps on these platforms. And we can probably command, you know, a higher price point than $200. But right now, you know, it's in the field, you're, you're starting to see consumers are, are being comfortable paying for these tools that they find, you know, really increases, uh, you know, uh, the ease of use of these devices and their utility. Okay. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point to uh, approach to go to the device manufacturers. And you mentioned you, were, you guys were device agnostic. So is that really you're focusing on point of care ultrasound, not the uh, traditional complete echocardiography like Philips, Siemens, like that are complete echo studies. Is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, where we see the future moving is, is um, um, as mentioned before, you know, to outpatient uh, ER settings. And we're seeing more and more doctors use it sort of as a, as a uh, stethoscope. And in fact, a lot of the the handled uh, the ultrasound manufacturers are, are almost, they're almost handing out their their devices for free. We, we regularly run into med school students who have access to a butterfly network device, um, where they're uh, you know just they're they're getting doctors used to using it in a sense as a as a stethoscope of the future. I think I was go I think I was going somewhere else with that. Can you remind me the the end of your <laughs> question? No, no, that's exactly the the the, the fact that you guys are going to be applying this to point of care ultrasound rather than yes. um, the traditional oh, so. complete ultrasound studies. Yes. So in that note, yes, we, we, you know, still there is a significant client base that would be, you know, let's say a uh, car based ultrasound. 
Um, and you know, they're there and we're not going to ignore them. It's not, it's, you know, it's not the primary focus. Right. Um, you know, we also see some other potential revenue streams in terms of like identifying, um, you know, retrospectively, you know, patients for, for trials for, you know, major, um, for major drug companies. And we've, we've been approached by, you know, a handful, um, but uh, primarily, uh, you know, the, the really emerging market of handheld ultrasound. Can sure you guys can. hear me? Okay. Yes, yes. we can. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay, very good. Um, there were a couple of questions around kind of your commercialization strategy um, and and go to market. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so as I was saying before, you know, we're 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 you know our product market fit is with ultrasound hardware manufacturers as a as a SaaS and their their platform, and it's it's something we're seeing being proven out. And from what we see, you know, it's like these handheld ultrasound devices. You know, you're using it with a smartphone, but it you know it's really it's like a it's like it's like a dumb phone, you know. It's, you get you're you're getting this, these incredible capabilities of you know being able to you know image anybody, any patient, and you're using like a, a small device. And uh, we view ourselves as sort of as as an app on those devices. And you know we can be plugged into you know any hardware manufacturer that be interested in partnering. Um, and from there, you know, command a uh, you know an annual subscription revenue, and. Um, and I can go a little bit more into detail again about how, you know, like how we're structuring in terms of, uh, you know, through the FDA and commercialization, if you'd like me to. Through your initial studies, what age or patient weight or body types have you been effectively been able to model? I mean, does this cover all pediatric all the way up to like aged populations? Like what does your data set look like? So, you know, our data set is um, it's representative of the United States adult population. So we, we don't have, uh, you know, we pediatric data, we don't, we don't really have a ton of, so we're not focusing on that. So for now it's, it's, uh, it's the adult U S population. And we really have a very, I mean, the fantastic thing about our data set is that it was collected, you know, across the United States by Dr. Penn's company over the past 20 years and is representative of all kinds of BMIs, you know, obviously it skews a little bit higher just because patients that get echoes tend to be, you know, a little bit less healthy. But really, across all BMIs, um, ages, ethnicities, and on top of that, uh, different machine types, you know, and uh, different doctors and clinically annotating the image, and different technicians, you know, taking the image. So it's it's really heterogeneous in, in every sense of the word. Could you give us a, a sample of what types of uh, platforms you do work on in terms of what your interoperability is? You said you're platform agnostic, but like, which ones have you done pilot studies with? So we really, I guess we have, in a sense, it's almost two offerings, but uh, powered by the same intelligence. So one is we have, a, you know, like a web application. I mean, it's not publicly open right now, but it's a web application that theoretically anybody can go and, um, you know, we have it on our private servers right now, but anybody can go in and, you know, upload right. an echo and, and get back results and they can view it, you know, in their, in their browser window. Um, and again, that's device agnostic. And what we're also doing is we're building an, an API. We, we've built an API that can be plugged in to, you know, any, any hardware manufacturer can theoretically connect to our API. I guess that's what the real question was. How do you know that your hardware manufacturers, have, have you tested it with all of the existing handheld uh, echocardiograms available? Uh, no, we haven't, but it's, it's really, it's very simple. When you're, when you're, when you're pinging this API, you're, you know, you're, you're just, you're sending an image back and these image files are not very large, these .com files. And, um, and, you know, our, our uh, API spits back, you know, just it's, it's sort of like just strings of, you know, text and numbers. It's, it's very simple data transfer okay. through an API. And any hardware manufacturer can, you know, theoretically decide however they want to display it. If they want to display it as overlays, if they want to display it, at, you know, throw it into a PDF or if they want to display it on the, the smartphone. Um, it's, a, it's a very simple interaction. So and one last would... in that theme, and since we are running out of time here, so I'm just giving one last shot here. Um, so you're getting this data set back. Is it structured in the sense that it's uh, uploadable directly to EHRs right now, or is it get, providing more qualitative data within your own app? I guess the question is, is it structured or unstructured data that can be pushed to the e, to directly to an EHR? Um, the the data set that we have is is uh, the the amazing thing about it is that it's very structured and uh you know dr penn's company was very meticulous about you know annotating it and uh and and uh you know keeping everything extremely organized mm -hmm. so it, it's uh it's a very structured data set and we spent a lot of the time at the beginning building the company 
building the infrastructure for this data set. So we can go through this data. So right now we can show, we can like type in, you know, aortic stenosis and we can get, you know, all the cases of aortic stenosis. And then we can, you know, we could, uh, you know, sort it by, by gender. We can right. sort it by age. I think it's the know. real question, but the note of the question from Megan here was that uh, the outputs that you guys generate, is it, do you currently have the capacity or do you have the capacity in the future of loading this directly into an EHR platform for the doctors? Or is this something that, the results of your studies, if they just reside within your app or are they exportable directly feeding oh, into yes. a records platform? Yes, they, they're, they're uh, very easily. That's, that's, I guess that's how we're designing the, the product. It can really right. be, you know, into any pack system or to a handle ultrasound, like whatever, wherever you want the results to display, they can display. It's just a matter of pinging the API. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so what are you looking to do next? You mentioned a version one and a version two what's the big difference between those two i, I didn't quite get the clarity between those sure so uh, i guess you know what we really have now is we have a collection of ai algorithms and tools that that analyze the echo um and we're rapidly building out you know new ai tools that identify more abnormalities you know calculations measurements and we're sort of adding them you know as we develop we're adding it to our platform weekly and we're collecting and packaging the most clinically useful i guess low-hanging fruit into our first submission which is the iCardio AI Brain V1. And while that is going through the process of being FDA cleared, we're going to continue to add AI tools to build out the iCardio AI Brain V2, you know, which will consist of most measurements and abnormalities that a cardiologist would detect and write up in a report. By the way, once something, you know, once it's at the, the Brain V1 is FDA cleared, that's, you know, when it's uh, commercializable, I guess, we, you know, clinicians, clinicians can start using it and get utility. So, you know, after the Brain V2, we're, we're going to continue to iterate and add further tools and perhaps expand outside of Echo, given our, you know, our infrastructure is primed for any form of ultrasound. And, you know, mm -hmm. we believe that, you know, as, as AI within diagnostics takes hold and, you know, becomes more and more reliable, and we're going to see the FDA become more comfortable with doctors relying on AI for the legwork. And I think we're also going to see, this is a little bit more distant, but we're going to see, you know, the CPT editorial panel add CPT codes for automated imaging. Um, which they're beginning to do. They've already done for myocardial strain imaging and, right. uh, you know, in the future, which will add a very large, you know, revenue stream, you know, reimbursements. Got it. And actually that's a really nice dovetail to one of Dr. Biggs's excellent questions here. And then I'm going to leave this as the last one because we do have to move on and give time for Miriam. Um, Dr. Biggs said, asks, there might be a market for the pre-interpretation of traditional cart-based echo, thereby lessening the interpretation load on the cardiologist further upstream. Is that something that you hope to like interject yourself into that workflow structure? And what is the what are the difficulties or challenges in terms of compensation models around that structure? And is your is your AI based system capable of doing so? Um, so yeah, again, right now it's not. This isn't something that you rely on for your uh, for your diagnosis. You just you know press the button, get a report, and then just you know uh, and uh, just total rely on that. It's going to take some time before. Uh, you know, a the FDA is comfortable with that, and uh, and also to the to the point where like the tech is totally perfect like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what we view more as it's it's more of a um, for for someone that's a cardiologist already. You know, it's more of a security blanket, and it's the kind for of someone who's that, not like, a cardiologist. Do you view this as like you're hoping to be almost a diagnostic triage, like warning light, send this further yeah. upstream for more detailed interpretation, or yes, yes, it's, so it's definitely. It's definitely something that, you know, they can use, uh, you know, in screening a patient. For example, if a patient comes into the ER or something like that, you know, you immediately slap on some gel, take an image, you know, get some information. And it's, you know, it's, you get very good, you know, quick, accurate information. And if you see there's, there's something that looks problematic, immediately recommend, um, you know, recommend upstream. And I think that you're going to see that, you know, happen more and more as more doctors get access to these devices. Got it. Great. Thank you so much, Jacob. This has been wonderful. For those of you who have questions, I know we had so many excellent questions. I know we didn't get to all of them. Uh, please join Jacob. Please join Happy, for that matter, Dr. Thakar, uh, at the networking session. We are going to be wrapping this up early, so we'll have 15 minutes to hang out a little bit before the State of the Union starts, uh, for those of you interested. Uh, with that, I'm going to toss it back to Jen, and she can introduce our next speaker. Uh, Jen, please. Thank you. And Jacob, thank you for your presentation and answering the questions so thoroughly. Um, I am excited to introduce um, Dr. Miriam Bower, um, who is the co-founder of Sonify Biosciences. Uh, Dr. Bower, I'm going to turn it over to you. 
All right, thanks for the introduction. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for coming. We are Sonify Biosciences, we're the hyperthermia people. Um, so Sonify is building better hyperthermia equipment. Uh, hyperthermia is a broadly active cancer therapy that gently heats and treats many types of tumors. There's, and there's absolutely no question that it works. Um, hyperthermia has decades of positive patient outcomes, existing US billing codes and full US Medicare reimbursement. But despite all that, less than 1% of people who are eligible for this therapy actually receive it. Um, hyperthermia therapy is so underused because radiation oncologists and other thermal oncology professionals have been struggling with bad equipment for nearly half a century. So currently available hyperthermia systems have challenges with accuracy, affordability, and non-invasiveness. Um, and temperature control is the limiting factor there. So one system only measures surface temperatures, so then that sacrifices accuracy. Um, another temperature feedback system is um, it's so prohibitively expensive that uh, literally nobody uses it. And a third option is... Um, well, it sacrifices patient experience with an extremely invasive and uncomfortable temperature feedback system. However, Sonify's technology sacrifices none of these. Um, we're, we meet all clinical and patient requirements. So our solution combines ultrasound-based heating with um, passive microwave radiometry-based temperature feedback. And both ultrasound and passive microwave radiometry are very well understood. Um, ultrasound, you know, along with being a very popular imaging technique, is a great way to heat things up. Um, passive microwave radiometry is a very sensitive thermal imaging approach that NASA uses to detect microwaves from um, the farthest reaches of the universe. And we're just taking that technology and bringing it a little bit closer to home. So here, ultrasonic energy propagates from the ultrasound transducer to the tumor site. The tumor site heats up. Our microwave patch antenna detects that temperature change, sends the data through a signal processor, and that signal processor increases or decreases the ultrasound transducer output to um, hold that temperature stable throughout the duration of the therapy, which is between, between 30 and 60 minutes. It just depends upon the practitioner and how they're used to using it. Um, so, Let's go here. So the question is, that was a really nice little infographic, but does it actually work? And the answer is yes. And here's some of our data. So on the left, ultrasound is providing like a really tight heating profile. Um, our doctors want accuracy to within one degree Celsius, and we are able to show it to within a quarter to half a degree. Um, and on the right, we have got a passive microwave antenna, and that can provide temperature feedback on par with an implanted fiber optic. So, you know, another question that we get a lot is, what is, this hasn't been done before. Why hasn't that, you know, why haven't we seen this? And the answer to that is that most of the systems that are on the market today heat via microwaves. And if you've got a microwave transducer working to heat up a volume of tissue, that generates a ton of noise um, that, would, that would completely overwhelm. Uh, a little antenna like the one pictured here, which should give you some some idea of the scale of that. It's about an inch in diameter, or like about two to two and a half centimeters in diameter. Um, so we overcome those issues by heating with ultrasound, and um, you know, combining ultrasound with this passive microwave radiometry is kind of the quote unquote special sauce that we're bringing to the table. Uh, and it's worth noting that we do have the freedom to operate. Uh, we've got intellectual property. Sonify has patents granted and pending in the EU and the US respectively uh, that protect our innovative approach. Um, and in clinic, you know, I mentioned that there's a lot of clinical data showing that hyperthermia works. Um, here's here's some of it. And um, hyperthermia is very effective, even with the shoddy equipment that um, the, these dedicated practitioners are still, you know, soldiering away with here. Um, hyperthermia is used to boost the efficacy of other therapeutics, most commonly radiation therapy. So comparing radiation alone to radiation plus hyperthermia shows a significant increase in complete responses in locally recurrent breast cancer, which is one of the fully reimbursed indications that are covered by existing billing codes. Um, melanoma is another, or locally recurrent melanoma is another fully reimbursed indication that has an existing billing code that responds well to hyperthermia. Um, and a fun fact about the paper that this data is from is that the authors reported that only 14, it's one four percent of the uh, hyperthermia treatments were actually hitting their mark. Um, so you can look at this data and imagine what the rate of complete responses might have been if they had uh, equipment that functions well. Uh, finally, another, my last example here is late stage head and neck cancer, which also responds to hyperthermia, um, as do soft tissue sarcomas, 
genitourinary cancers like cervical cancer and prostate cancer and even glioblastomas um, are on this you know, part of this non-exhaustive list of cancers that respond to hyperthermia. Um, hyperthermia should be the next radiation therapy and it should have been in the 90s, but um, you know, due to those equipment shortcomings, it never fulfilled its potential. But with Sonify's innovations, um, we could make that a reality. So we're currently raising money to fund a build out of our MVP. Um, and about one to one and a quarter million dollars will get us there and we'll also fund some preliminary animal work. Um, we expect to enter the market around 2024. Uh, we've got institutions domestically and abroad that have already expressed interest in using um, Sonify's product the moment it's approved. Uh, we've also identified institutions both for future investment to fully marketize the product organically within Sonify, uh, as well as institutions that could be potential acquirers in, by the end of 2025. So um, we're a very open and innovative management team. We bring new meaning to bootstrapping. Um, and so with the help of our advisors, we've identified a significant amount of non-dilutive funding sources in Brazil. So we've got a licensing deal down there with a device manufacturer and distributor already. Um, and we see a very rewarding future doing uh, some proportion of our work in Brazil where the technical talent is absolutely world-class and the costs are low. Um, so here's our team. Um, we've got extensive technical depth. We've got physicians, we've got hyperthermia specialists, engineers, biochemists, physicists on our, on our team here. Um, and we're equally strong with our business and sales. So we've got seasoned tech, biotech generally, and um, device specific veterans with experience in small startups, um, medium as well as medium and large sized ventures, scaling up successful exits. They've got you know IPOs under their belts and um, some have led publicly traded multinational corporations. So we are ready to go. <laughs> um, thanks so much for listening and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Dr. Power. That was fantastic. You know, I'm always, uh in admiration of companies that are able to take existing uh, uh, technology, but use it in novel ways to really take the entire uh, delivery system to the next level. Very, very cool. Particularly like the fact that your microwave antennas are used for like cosmic background radiation. So you can dual use there. Uh, Dr. Takar, I know it's a little bit outside of your cardiology experience, but being an experienced radiologist, I'm sure you're familiar with the equipment involved. Uh, what do you think of this technology and what do you think of uh, forward use and hurdles to adoption? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Barr. That was a great presentation. And it really sounds like a pretty exciting opportunity thinking of it as a carving out a niche in a, um, you know, existing, uh, existing approach, but doing it with this new, very broadly applicable uh, uh, technology with IP protection. So, um, yeah, my, my initial thoughts, it, it, it's... Um, I wonder, you know, I'm not an uh, expert in oncology, but um, you mentioned how the uh, clinical efficacy data is is there for hyperthermia, but it's underutilized. Yeah. I wonder um, if the, uh, presumably all the data up till now has been through this microwave, pre-existing microwave technology. Um, so I wonder, are all those data applicable to your modality, which is to say, regardless of uh, the mechanism of heating of hyperthermia, uh, is that efficacy data applicable, not only in the sense that it, it works, just as long as you heat it in any way, microwave or ultrasound, but also the adverse effect profile. Um, is there more or less adverse effects like that occur with any sort of heating modality? Um, so the method of heating itself is doesn't matter. You're just heating it up. Like where, you know, microwaves, remember, that's non-ionizing radiation. Um, so you're not affecting anything at a, you know, directly like a, like you would with ionizing radiation where that actually, you know, induces things like double stranded DNA breaks. None of that's happening. This is a gentle heat. Um, the problem that we're tackling is how do we heat up a volume of tissue and how do we keep that tissue temperature stable to within one degree Celsius for 30 to 60 minutes? So, um, if anything, uh, once Sonify's equipment gets out there in clinic, we will see, um, I think more consistency in the data. Um, you know, like, like I had a slide up there from a paper where even though we saw like an appreciable level of complete responses that, you know, increased with the use of hyperthermia versus, you know, hyperthermia plus radiation versus radiation alone, um, that was only with 14% of those treatments actually hitting their target. Mm -hmm. Uh, and once that problem, which, which is based around temperature feedback, <laughs> once that problem gets solved, um, there may be 
there may be a, uh, a refinement of the existing body of data, but it's going to, for the most part, remain the same. And does your technology, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, there has to be a focus of the signal uh, in the ultrasound yeah. beam. Uh, how do you do that and how deep can it penetrate? Uh, is there, is there uh, you know, only at surface level or is there internal ultrasound delivery system that you've created? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so both ultrasound and passive microradiometry are focusable. Uh, they both operate at depth. Um, so part of what we're raising money to do is to find out what those limitations are. How deep can we go? Um, we know that we can go from zero to two centimeters below patient skin surface. Uh, and we know that for sure. Um, so like we're starting out with uh, a device that will be intended for superficial tumors. Um, as our research continues and we find out what the, you know, what the parameters of what we're doing, we find out what they are, um, we will uh, like our, I mean, gosh, I can't tell you how many times we've heard from our KOLs that like, you know, how deep can you go? Can you go eight centimeters yet? Um, so <laughs> that's like something we are, we're really looking forward to sinking our teeth in to as we, you know, once we raise money and we can start working uh, on our, on this build out. Very exciting. Yeah, Mike, you want to handle some of these questions? Yeah, sure. I'll toss some balls yeah. in here. Uh, first and foremost, though, to the audience itself, Make sure, make sure you click on that poll link in there. The feedback you guys provide these companies is invaluable. Uh, one of the reasons they want to come here and present to this wonderful and intelligent crowd is so that they can get your feedback on an ongoing basis. So please do them the service of answering a, just a very few number of uh, multiple choice questions. Now, with that, um, so one of the things that struck me immediately on this is that Given the inadequacies in the current hyperthermia uh, equipment out there to provide treatment and therefore the lack of adoption that we've seen in the space, do you foresee any hurdles in terms of getting into the space to kind of convince people that have been, you know, grown to be skeptical of the, pro of the procedure over the last 10 to 20 years? Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely one of the hurdles we do have to overcome, like you say, is skepticism. I mean, these are like the reputation that hyperthermia equipment has is that it is hard to use. It's, it's hard to position. It's hard to move around. It's unwieldy. It does, it's not accurate. Um, and all that, like, yeah, that's true. And we're going to have to overcome that. Um, you know, Any ideas how you're going to do that. That seems yeah. like a problem. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, well, the, the nice thing is that there are still people who are, who, you know, are, are very much looking forward to, um, improved equipment. Uh, and that's like, we have, we have some evidence of that. We have, um, you know, I mean, first of all, we're building to the spec of our KOLs and we've got, you know, experts in the field. Some of like the world's leading experts in hyperthermia are a part of our team and have been, um, kind of steering our work. So that's number one. And, you know, I'm going to come back to like there being interest. So we know that there's interest in improved the pro improved product because like the first several devices that we manufacture are already spoken for. Um, we've got some institutions here in the U.S. We also have some institutions in um, the Netherlands and Germany, which are the top two um, per capita users of hyperthermia in clinic. Um, and we're also exploring how to um, integrate like CME courses uh, for education to broaden our reach. So anybody who wants to help us do that, like come hit us up afterwards. <laughs> that matter, audience, like if you're interested in getting a continuing education course on it, let us know. We can even set that up on this platform. That'd be a great topic for discussion at a future time. Oncology is a specific specialty next quarter anyway. So that'd be a great opportunity for us to do that. Um, so given that, the existing equipment, like the, the process itself, both uh, ultrasound heating and microwave uh, um, measurement are both within the realm of accepted procedures. What do you foresee as your regulatory process for adoption here in terms of approval? Um, okay, so to begin with, all hyperthermia devices are class three products. So it's not necessarily going to be a 510k walk through the park here. But that being said, um, you know, there are hyperthermia devices that are like already on the market and there's tons of data and there's no need for us to reinvent the wheel. So what we're going to do is go for a generic hyperthermia label. Um, and that means we're going to show safety and efficacy. Like we're going to show that we can say, okay, we're going to heat up this target volume of tissue and we're going to hold it there for 60 minutes. Um, and the follow-up would be, you know, do we see any signs of heat damage? Do we see any burning? Do we see any redness? Do we see any blisters? Um, those would be 
the questions that we answer. So the patient cohort would be fairly small. It would be approximately you know, 14 to 16 patients. And the follow-up would be short, be about three months, because like I said, we're not looking to reinvent the wheel by doing indication-specific um, clinicals uh, right just to enter the market. Um, so, you know, and we don't expect to see any heat damage because hyperthermia is generally regarded as having, I mean, well, the scientist in me backs away from saying, oh, it has no side effects, but it is essentially side effect free. <laughs> um, so we think that this will, you know, help accelerate our path through the FDA. Okay, great. And just as a reminder, I know you had your timeline up there. When do you expect to be in market at this time? Um, about 2025. 25. Okay. And uh, just one last question around the, a little more detail about the types of tumors that you believe you'll be able to treat. I know mm -hmm. you specifically mentioned that people are asking, can you get to eight centimeters deep and so on? But for now, what is your expectation in terms of the size, types of tumors, and the depths that you will be able to treat or at least assist in treatment with this type of problem? Uh, sure. Yeah. So anything zero to two centimeters below skin surface, we absolutely know that we could do. Mm -hmm. um, this is a like, so the problem from a, from like a scientific technical pers like perspective that we're tackling, it's actually easier to work larger than it is to work smaller. Um, so, you know, we can, we can small, like small for us is about the volume of a sugar cube. Um, the nice thing is that, you know, we, yes, we want to keep the margins around a tumor as tight as we can, but because hyperthermia is generally considered to be side effect free, if healthy tissue is, um, treated as well, it, uh, generally you have no change and, you know, and it's health, uh, it, it gets, gets through this therapy very, very easily. So. Um, you know, small, like I said, smaller volumes are a little bit more difficult and that's kind of what we want to see. We want to like check out like, what are our parameters? We know we can do a sugar cube. Can we do anything smaller and can we do anything deeper than two centimeters? And if so, how deep? And we expect that we can. Um, I just don't want to, you know, deliver false promises here. Um, and as far as like tumor types, like I said, any superficial tumor that responds that is known to respond to hyperthermia, um, you know, go forth, use our equipment, conquer. Um, any, you know, any deeper tissue, any deeper tumors within the viscera, like one of the things that, that is really interesting to us is, for example, um, pancreatic cancer, because it has a lot of the same uh, hallmarks of like of melanoma. And if melanoma responds as well to hyperthermia, then, hey, let's like tackle pancreatic cancer. There are so few treatment options for people out there. Like, yeah, like, let's do it. Um, so it's, it's it's a pretty like I said it's pre, it's broadly active. I mean we've got locally recurrent breast cancer, locally recurrent melanoma. We have glioblastomas, head and neck cancers, um, soft tissue sarcomas, uh, prostate cancer, uh, cervical cancer, and there are others. And those are the those are the ones that I kind of store on the tip of my tongue. Well, I'm going to move on yeah. just because I, I know we have so many quest, great questions, and I'd love to ask them all. But I'm going to do one last one before we close out, and that's uh, an excellent question from Dr. Kaplan regarding uh, competitive technology, specifically cryoablation, radiofrequency uh, uh, treatments. Um, is this a standalone product? It's meant to be operated only in pairing with radio uh, radiological treatments or like how, how exactly does it compare to other techniques? Sure, um, so hyperthermia, think about hyperthermia as something that can boost the efficacy of other therapies. Um, I stuck to, at this, this particular presentation, I stuck to radiation therapy um, because that's what it's used most commonly in clinic and that's because that's what Medicare covers. Um, but it also boosts the efficacy of different kinds of chemotherapeutics. Uh, some examples would be the platinum-based chemotherapeutics as well as uh, gemcitabine. Um, there's also a lot of really exciting data coming out uh, with hyperthermia in combination with immunotherapies. And um, we're on Merck's radar uh, because they are interested to see how, you know, what our device can um, can do when combined with an immune checkpoint inhibitor like their PD-1, PD-L1 uh, drug that they make. So um, also just, just like, just to be clear, um, this is non-ablative. This is like, mm -hmm. it just, you know, so we're not really in this, we're not, we're not like a surgical technique at the end of the day. This is not what we are. We are not burning. So like burning temperatures are about 44 degrees Celsius and above. Um, hyperthermia is like this local hyperthermia um, is 41 to 43 Celsius. So we don't, we don't hit those burning temperatures just, just to be clear. It also does then suggest an easier uh, regulatory approval process since you're not seeking to be the direct. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just we. Yeah, we want to show that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're if assistant. you're going for an indication, if you're going for an indication specific, yes, but we're going for generic hyperthermia. So, at least out the gate, just so we can get to market faster, um, 
we're trying to keep it uh, simple. But that's not to say that in the future we will not go back and do, um, you know, some some uh, indication specific trials. But just to start, so we can get to hit market faster, we're going to keep it for generic hyperthermia. That also makes us a better target for acquisition. Yeah. Excellent point. Excellent yeah. point. Um, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bauer. Uh, love having you guys here. Uh, we only got to maybe half of the questions out there. and I know you guys have many more. Please join Miriam after the words. I know we're, we promised we'd get you out of here early and we're already up to 10 minutes before the hour. So I'm going to toss this right back to Jen, who I know had some great questions for Dr. Thakar before we wrap up. Jen, if you want to take it away from here. Thank you. Um, Dr. Thakar, I'm going to bring you back up on stage with me We're on the main part of the stage. Yeah. Um, so first, tell me about um, any of the interesting innovation and new technology that you're seeing um, in cardiology. Yeah, there's there's a, a lot of different um, uh, innovations coming out. Uh, you know, for, for in the cardiac imaging space for the past several years, there's been a lot of excitement around artificial intelligence, machine learning. And as we saw today, you know, the cardio AI platform, that's exactly the type of low hanging fruit where it's clear that there's you know economic benefit in terms of healthcare systems as well as clinical benefit in terms of how uh, we can integrate um, these machine learning algorithms to augment uh, clinicians and help clinical decision making. And th this is the type of stuff where we can annotate data and label it uh, you know uh, in, a, in a more robust and uh, um, uh, thorough way with computer assistance. Right now, all of that is being done manually and it takes a lot of uh, time and effort, but also has a lot of um, uh, poor quality of data because of that. So just last or a couple months ago, now Phil the Philips um, uh, uh, and, and GE platforms, the most, their most recent software and hardware platforms have started integrating these very type of AI algorithms to automatically help the sonographers label and detect and characterize um, cardio, uh, uh, cardiac parameters like LV wall thickness and ejection fraction without every single step being manual, which is the case right now. Um, and in the future, I think we're going to see more and more of that um, being incorporated, uh, assuming, you know, uh, we get additional um, kind of regulatory uh, and clinical guidelines to align in that same direction as well. And then outside of just the imaging, like, you know, software space, there's a lot um, in, in the last few months and years focused around cardiac CT. Last year, actually, the um, last fall, the internet for the first international chest pain management guidelines came out, and they put cardiac CT as uh, on par with um, nuclear uh, stress testing as well as echocardiographic stress testing, which is the first time this has been, been done. And and so there's a lot of excitement about coronary CT. Uh, we're going to see a lot more coronary CT scans. Um, to, to help manage chest pain and and coronary ct just provides you know anatomic information but there's companies now heart flow you know being the most prominent um example of it that takes that anatomic information just those images and does post-processing um to extract physiologic and uh, physiologic data the, the heart flow algorithms are you know kind of a black box and they they say they do some sort of computational uh, 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 fluid dynamics to arrive at their conclusions, but they provide, you know, very clinically meaningful data based on just anatomic information. So I think the the challenge is trying to do that very com computationally intense uh, algorithms in a more robust and easily accessible way, rather than shipping them out to um, you know Stanford or wherever they wherever HeartFlow is located. So and we are seeing like AI platforms that promise to replicate that without actually doing that intense computational um, back, uh, uh, work. Um, and then in cardiac devices, I'm really excited about a, a recent approval also for shockwave lithotripsy, intravascular lithotripsy. This is in the cath lab where we normally, when there's a lot of heavy calcification burden, have uh, resorted to devices like um, laser atherectomy or mechanical atherectomy, where there's a really, really a, literally a rotor rooter going in and removing the calcium inside the coronary arteries, which um, you know can create a lot of adverse effects uh, in rare circumstances. How are they gaining access fiber optically, or like how do they gain access for your rotor rooter here? Your yeah, so no, this is in the cath lab where we uh, send um, a, a wire down the artery of the heart uh, and. Along, on top of that wire, like as if as using the wire as a rail, um, 
this mechanical rotor rooter is sent in essentially, and it 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 spins you know at thousands of rotations per minute and and eliminates the calcium on on the edges of the um, of the artery. But then you know it's not it's underutilized because it is kind of a risky you know people are concerned about the, yeah. the com complication rates. Are. But now this intravascular lithotripsy. Uh, just approved in December of last year. It, there's a lot of excitement around that because it has none of those adverse or very few of those adverse effects. Um, it, it works the same way as we get rid of kidney stones. Uh, you know, it's a shock wave, a, a, a sonographic shock wave um, that eliminates um, the calcium. And, and so I think we're going to see a lot more use of that in the near future as well. Good. Instead of blades or something else, we're using much something much more gentler to the walls of the uh, of the cavities. Right. Right. Um, and right now, people, we we kind of you know when we do these procedures, unfortunately, uh, they're they're sometimes not being done at all because they require special tertiary level of of uh, of care at a, at a facility that can handle that. So, but I think um, you know these sorts of advances that prevent those rare rare complications will make this sort of technology start becoming more um, commonly used. Awesome. I'll keep our eye, eyes out for that. Any other cool devices you think are coming down the pipe that we should be looking for startups that are servicing in that space? Uh, you know, I think I think devices uh, in the imaging imaging space are, are probably um, uh, not going to be as common as all of this uh, layers of technology being put on top of that. Just like today, mm -hmm. our, our uh, cardiac AI folks you know demonstrated that their their platform. I mean, you know, it's a really cool and important. Um, uh, set of tools that can be implanted to any sort of device. And that's really what we should be trying to trying to do, where we have the last 10, 15 years of electronic medical records and separate devices that silo data. And I think more and more, not just in EMR, but imaging and everything else, we're, we should, we are trying to incorporate um, everything into stream, streamline into either device agnostic or um, or, or uh, you know, widely usable software that doesn't require specialized uh, data silos. So uh, I'm hoping we see a lot more of that, and, and that will open up all sorts of possibilities. I think because you know it's like your iPhone, right? You can add an app ten years ago uh, uh, on the same device and completely open up a new set of uh, to mech, uh, you know things you could do with it you could never have done before. Right, hybrid, hybrid, hybrid. It's like in real estate, location, location, location. <laughs> Technology, it feels like it's hybrid, 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 whether it's merging uh, technical efficiency and digital uh, with devices or whether it's merging two different types of devices together like uh, uh, Dr. Bauer and uh, Sonify have. Uh, with that, I think that's a beautiful transition to a shout out to our two extension companies who will be attending in the networking session afterwards. And I highly recommend you check out their videos for their uh, extension videos and their updates. One is MRI Online, which is attempting to utilize AI to enhance MRI imaging and education, to upskill existing uh, service providers, and to improve the training and efficacy of experienced ones. Um, the other one is Fisher Imaging, who did present at a pitch club, a thing in women's health about six months ago. They're combining ultrasound with classic uh, uh, mammogram uh, technology to improve both the quality, efficacy, and comfort of patients. So take a look at their uh, product as well. Um, Dr. Thakar, do you have any closing statements you'd like to have? I forgotten anything? Did I lose anything along the way here? Uh, no, no, I think you covered everything. And, and uh, thanks so much for the presenters and those excellent presentations and for everyone to be here uh, and for having me really. Well, and thank you. Uh, you know, the valuable insights from experts like yourselves is exactly why uh, I love working with Angel MD so much. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, we love having you here.